Hare Krishna Madhavanand Prabhu, thank you very much for joining once again for the Monks podcast. Many devotees expressed appreciation about the talk which we had and many requests came also that we should continue it. So thank you for sparing your time also. So I'll just try to do a quick recap of what we discussed. It's difficult, but we'll, we'll just as a background to take it forward. So basically we discussed about how to create room for individual expression within an institution. And then we discussed about how you know, the students, they become alumni. And that way, as devotees, we need to, uh, bhakti involves expressing the heart. So there is art, there is creativity, and that requires a certain level of individual expression. And for that, the space is needed. So you give the example of so Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu supported organized religion in Jagannath Puri, but he also had his space in Gambira. And you had several, the example of Bhakti, when, of Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur and Lalit Prasad, also about two different visions of how Bhakti is to be practiced. And while Prabhupada established an institution, but Prabhupada also gives, uh, emphasized that Bhakti is individual. I think you mentioned ISV, individual, spontaneous, voluntary. <laughs> and then you yeah. also talked about how Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness through love, trust, empowerment, and was it appreciation? Responsibility. Love, responsibility, trust, responsibility. Yeah, responsibility, yeah. So in that sense, yeah. Prabhupada did not choke individuality at all. He gave adequate space for that. And then we discussed that uh, for if devotees are actually going to go about doing this, it, it should not be like an institutional rebellion, but it needs to be more a call from the heart and then Krishna will respond. And then a devotee can move forward. And uh, overall, the, the theme was that as devotees grow and mature, each devotee needs to be situated in, the, in bhakti in a way that they can make their individual contribution. Bhakti is a personal relationship with Krishna. And then a couple of examples also you gave about how the water keeps the boat afloat when it is outside, but when the water comes inside, it sinks the boat. So like that, the institution and its dynamics are outside. They are required for many of us to practice bhakti. But if they come inside, if you become too obsessed with the institution, then it will become a problem. So that was a broad summary, Prabhu. Thank you. <laughs> so, so two, three questions which we can follow up. You want to add anything on that or should I just start? I would like to follow up with some things. I don't know how extensively we want to discuss it, but one thing I, I would very much would like to discuss is uh, what is ISKCON and who's really a member? These are, these are very, very important topics. Legal terminology is really important. This is not legal terminology. This is heartfelt terminology. Yes. But that's something I, I don't know. At some, some point, it would be nice to discuss that. I think the bodies would find that valuable. <clears throat> yeah, I think then let's go ahead in that direction because in, that is very important in the sense that if we are saying the individual space, then we are presuming a particular definition of ISKCON. But uh, right. often there might not be a clear definition for right now, as far as I know, we don't have a clear definition of ISKCON member. Who, who is a ISKCON member? You know? I'll, I'll give you, if, you, if we want to start this, I'll, I'll give you something a little even more radical to think about. Exactly. My grandmother sometimes would say, what is ISKCON? Pretty simple question in a way, right? And he would answer it himself, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And then he would say, who's really a member? Someone who's Krishna conscious. And at least on one occasion, in front of about 100 devotees, he pointed at me at that point. He said, Madhavananda, not yet joined. <laughs> so when the devotees, they say... When did you join the ISKCON? I say, well, it's a great idea. <laughs> and so bearing that in mind, for me, that's the real ISKCON. And there's some external thing, just like the Ganga. May, there may be dead bodies on it. There may be urine and stool on it. But that's not the Ganga. That's some external thing on top of it. The Ganga is always pure. And ISKCON is Prabhupada's desire. 
and it's a society for Krishna consciousness. So it, it's always pure in that sense. And if we bear that in mind, if we bear in mind what Srila Prabhupada's desire for the society was, then I, I always want to be part of that society. And I'm not discouraged when I see stool and dead bodies <laughs> and things like that on it, because that's not really ISKCON. That's something else. I remember having a discussion, one of those terrible discussions on Facebook, <laughs> which I don't know if you do, but you may have heard about. And there, everybody was on in the GBC. And I wasn't taking part in the discussion, but someone had tagged me. And at one point, I, I'm a passionate person. I couldn't control myself. And I spoke up. And there were a number of senior devotees, or very senior devotees. And I, I didn't mention anybody's name. I wanted to be polite enough for that. But I said, I find it very depressing that someone's been chanting Hare Krishna for over 50 years and they're still going to treat me like I'm an institution or like I'm an American or like I'm a male. And yes, I'm a member of ISKCON and yes, I, I, I was born in America, I'm a U.S. citizen and yes, I have a male body, but I don't like when people take away my personality and individuality. If somebody's been chanting Hare Krishna mantra for 10 years or in this case it was over 50 years, and still, they, they say the ISKCON people. I, I, I said it, that I find that very depressing. Just like if you've been a devotee for so many years, and you're going to say, yeah, that, that American Madhavananda, or that male Madhavananda, that those are some of Padi's designations that I have. But if you're going to hang that Padi around my neck like, like a label, then what you're doing also is taking away some of my individuality and some of my personality. And you may be doing that with a lot of people. It's, it's a kind of violence, actually, to just say all the Indian devotees or the Russian devotees or the ISKCON devotees or the Babaji's. It, it, it's, it's really crazy. None of, it's not that when I joined ISKCON, I got Kaivalya Mukti, and now I am ISKCON. Who, who would think like that? So I, I, I told them, I said, for me, I respect the managers. I want to work with the managers because that's what you do to help the movement go on. But I don't see the GBC or the temple presidents as ISKCON. Mm. For me, and I posted a photograph in that discussion of a, a picture from the Bhakti Sangam Festival in Ukraine where there's about 14,000 Russian-speaking devotees who are crying and chanting Hare Krishna. And I said, for me, this is ISKCON. So ISKCON is going to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I, I would suggest that we should try to think, what is ISKCON for Srila Prabhupada? And, and, and how can I be a member of that society? And if I'm not, it, it, even if the managers don't appreciate it, but if Srila Prabhupada appreciates it, <laughs> then I feel very happy. <laughs> That's true. So, you know, this is a profound point. Actually, just uh, one by one, I would like to just say that when you mentioned about you know, joining ISKCON, sometimes you would ask this question, how did you come to Krishna consciousness? Right. One answer I heard that, that actually I have not yet come to Krishna consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> we are all struggling to come. And the second point about individuality, you know, I was reading a book on the existence of God by a Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. And he said that, you know, everything in this world is individual. So every particle of sand is different. Every snowflake is different. And then he said, uh, every Hare Krishna monk is different. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, it's good. <laughs> So that institution. The holy name is book. <laughs> yeah, that was in his book. <laughs> so his point was things may look homogeneous externally, but they are individual. Mm. Yeah, you know sometimes it is probably uh, maybe we are among the few institutions that if somebody says to us, hey, you know, I heard your class. Your class doesn't sound like Iskon. We would. <laughs> We may, <laughs> you know, we may consider that as a compliment and not as a criticism. So, 
yeah there is a certain amount of stereotyping that happens and maybe that could be because we were to some extent our origin was somewhat similar to a cult although we were never a cult but it was similar to a cult and there was a lot of emphasis on world rejection so then there is a certain perception so you know we could look at this from just to expand your point of the question you know when we talk about iskon who is a iskon member so how outside people perceive us as iskon then how we perceive each other as iskon or we how we we self identify as iskon and then how you know if we all have certain definitions of what a devotee is and if that somebody doesn't fit in that defo- definition we might say that you are not iskon so ravindra swarup prabhu uh, was telling me about how he how congregation outreach started and this now we have many places where every week a program happens but in the past there was nothing like that so he said that generally preaching meant people should move into the temple and many hindus when they started coming to our temples in the west can you hear me prabhu yes very so, good point thank you when, when the hindus started coming to the temples so we tried to preach to them to move into the temple and they had no interest in that and after that we thought they are not they are never going to become devotees and so yes, right. we stopped paying attention to them mm-hmm. so they would come to the temples but we would not pay much attention to them and he said that but they were regularly coming week after week after week after week and he said that if a, somebody on the streets had asked those people you know which religious demon, denomination do you belong to so they would have said yeah we are we are hari krishnas but if somebody had asked us are these hari krishnas are these hari krishnas she would have said no they are not hari krishnas <laughs> <laughs> so he said only after years we saw that they were coming regularly and they were already to offer support financially and otherwise doing services then gradually the definition of iskon expanded from somebody who resides in the temple to somebody who is committed to certain level of practices so now uh when you say somebody who is krishna conscious that's that is also quite at one level abstract we could say nobody is krishna conscious or anybody who even except knows about krishna and the krishna conception of god even that can be called krishna conscious yes so in principle the definition is very inclusive it can be very inclusive uh but in the real world i don't know how how practical that definition would be so any thoughts on this yeah. well both things need to be there for a society to function you need brahmins you need thinkers who some people may say what you're saying is not practical but it's philosophy and it's ideas and it's in one sense very practical and important because it's philosophy and ideas which motivate everyone but at the same time it's a fact we also need to have managers and leaders who are doing the the grassroots or the other hands on uh, type of work M- my personally i i'm very dedicated to prabhupad's mission and i see is kind of shiva prabhupad save a sangha that i'm yeah, one of the men some day i don't see it as an institution that causes pain in my heart but at the same time i recognize the fact that as my grandma once said the prabhupad started the life membership program for people who like to play the white flute white flute is cigarettes <laughs> <laughs> it means that people who are not going to join but they could feel like they're part of the society and in that sense not it, it, we have to see this very slowly and we have to think about it very deeply because I'm, what I'm about to say is going to sound very disturbing to some people but in one sense the whole purpose of the society is for neophytes how is that the, the advanced devotees they're very dedicated to the seva sangha of their guru and they'll never leave that but for neophyte devotees they need to be a member and they need to, there needs to be a hierarchy there needs to be managers and institutions and so many things like that 
And someone who's wise, as Krishna says in the Gita, he says, a wise person doesn't disturb someone who has a lower quality of faith because it's necessary. Srila Prabhupada wanted this society. He wanted people to feel like they're a member, they belong to something. And yes, maybe it's a little bit of a lower kind of understanding of bodies and designations, but it's required for some people. And devotees who are wise and, and who ha have a heart to serve Srila Prabhupada, I feel will see it in that way. And therefore, they'll want to support the managers. I, I often tell thinking devotees that we should always support the managers because if you don't support the managers, you may become a manager. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then your life is going to be very difficult. <laughs> so just to keep my life simple, I want to support the managers. And I have no, uh, uh, what's the word, the no sense of, no, no false misunderstanding. I have no misunderstanding that the managers are always going to be perfect. Of course they're not. Right? They're going to make mistakes. But we, and we have to forgive them and, and let them go on because we need someone who can take that headache of dealing with money and with politics and organization and things and dealing with, with single women and, and so on. It's a big headache. We need someone who can take on that responsibility. And, and, and someone who, is there someone who's a real thinker? We want to encourage thinkers. If someone's a real artist, they should support those managers. Because without those managers, where's the box going to be for them to continue the, to make the gift? We spoke last, last session about the box, which yeah. is like the institution, the gift, which is inside. So if people want to work on making the gift, that's nice. But if you don't have a box to put it in, it may get lost. You may drop it. Yes. And so that, that institution, the management is very important. Yeah. And of course, they should be righteous persons. They should be honest. They, they shouldn't be rascals. And there's so many things we can go on and say about that. That's an entirely another topic. For me personally, maybe because I've been independent from the institution for so many years, although I, I travel most of the year, I go to temples. And, and I, whenever the first thing I do when I go to a temple I speak with the temple president and I ask him, what is the mood of your project? I want to know, how can I serve you? Because I don't want to just come in and create a disturbance. I want to, I want to understand what is the mood of your project, and how I can serve it. And I give them respect and I give them support. Of course, if they're nonsense, or if they're saying something which I, I don't think Prabhupada would like, then in a philosophical way in my class, I bring that up, kind of going in the back door so to speak, to bring that up. But I, I very much believe in, in working with the devotees because I've seen so many revolutionaries and today's revolutionaries are tomorrow's orthodox management. Yeah. It, it always happens like that. And the management is just something that needs to be there. Krishna comes again and again to protect Indra. Indra is a supreme manager. But we don't pay much attention to Indra. We pay attention to the bridge bossies, even though Indra disrespected them and demanded that they worship him. And Krishna Jiva Goswami says was angry, thinking, my family members, the bridge bossies, my family members, my community, they're millions of times more exalted than Indra. And this Indra is so puffed up that he's demanding their respect from them. But still, Krishna smashed his pride. But he reinstated him. He didn't take away his position. He supported his position of Indra. And this is something we were saying in our last session also, that as unpalatable as it sounds, God always supports organized religion. <laughs> Jagannath always supports the Pandas. And <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also did not for it. But if you're a thinker, if you're an artist, if, if you want to do something more, then it's required sometimes to be a little more out of the box. Devotees need to be empowered in whatever situation that can be in. Maybe it's remaining as a regular part of the institution, teaching and managing the, the, uh, the institution, the society, the school or whatever. That's great. But you can't do it unless you're given some respect, some love and trust, 
and you're given some responsibility. Otherwise, you can't reach your full potential. Now, of course, we have to earn that, that love and trust. Trust is not a one-way street. You should just trust me, but give me the keys to your car. And you don't even know what kind of driver I am. I have to earn your trust. We need to earn the trust of guru, earn the trust of our acharyas. And obviously we do that by being dedicated to Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada's mission. That's true. So I like that statement, you know, if you don't respect or we reject managers, we will end up becoming managers. <laughs> I see it so many times. Profound. <laughs> yeah. You know, in many ways, uh, even Brahmanas, actually Brahmanas can do their own Brahmanical work, but the reach of the Brahmanical work will often depend on the Kshatriyas. And if we can equate roughly the Kshatriyas with managers, there can be nuances, but broadly, if we equate that, so, you know, say both of, I mean, you are much more senior to me, but both of us are traveling preachers. But if there were no well-managed temples, we would be very limited in being able to go out and do any outreach. We would be sitting underneath a tree in Tompkins Square Park. <laughs> I thought you would say sitting under a tree in Vrindavan, but Tompkins Square Park was really striking. Yeah. We could go there, but we wouldn't be able to do anything. Anything substantial. Yeah. And then this point about... Again, that God supports organized religion. This is quite significantly different from there is a sometimes a vehement criticism that sometimes people say that the last Christian uh, died died two thousand years ago. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. So <laughs> there is a that the, it's a, instead of ha having that extreme. So if we consider a pendulum, you know, one extreme would be complete rejection of the rejection or condemnation of the institution that could be one extreme and then second extreme would be like completely identifying the spirituality with the institution itself that means because i am a iscon member therefore i am a i am a devotee already and <laughs> so so I, so if we have a balance that is we respect the institution but we also respect we could maybe you could use the word respect respect the purpose of the institution but, but if you give more money, you're a better devotee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you know. See, there is this, there was a critical Bollywood movie about organized religion. Uh, two movies were there. So one of the movies had this depiction that say if there is a, if there is a temple and there is a queue for darshan, so if somebody pays more, then you are given darshan quickly. Otherwise, you don't pay, you have to go normally. So their argument was that religion is simply a business. That this is simply in Hindi, they say, Shraddha ka dhanda hai. This is, this is a business of faith. So, you know, I had written the response. I had written a small booklet responding to the accusation in that movie. So I wrote back saying that, okay, even if you say that this is a business of faith, then this movie is doing a business of criticizing faith. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that the movie is a charitable endeavor. So in some ways, there are certain things within the institution which can come off as quite materialistic. And to some extent, the institution may also need to manage perceptions, but some things are just the way it will be. We can't avoid that kind of perceptions being created. But at the same time, if there is a due respect, without institution, most people will not be really able to uh, practice bhakti even at a basic level. So sometimes, like what you mentioned that about the neophyte, see, we, so we could put it this way two ways. For the neophytes, or for those who are new, often the institution helps them to, to start off on their spiritual journey. And for those who, are, those who are maybe more experienced, more advanced, often the institution helps them to, to guide others. So if we see the institution, can you hear me, Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. I, I, I'm, just, I'm drinking it in. 
thank you. <laughs> so if you consider the institution simply as a forum for uh, say younger as well as senior devotees to interact with each other then we could have a much more uh, a non uh, a non official or non bureaucratic view of the institution and one of my favorite quotes of prabhupada from the nectar of instruction is in that was gohiyam akhyati pruchyati prabhupada says that the purpose of the krishna consciousness movement is to nourish these six fold exchanges among devotees yes. so this that 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 could, so if that could be a non institutional view of a institution you could say or a non non bureaucratic view of a institution so maybe you could talk about a little bit about why sometimes as devotees also we may perceive institutions negatively and how we can see them you mentioned something but maybe something about how we could see them more positively yeah um first of all let, let me go back a little comment and something you yeah. just mentioned about the managers being like chatrias i i would very that that although they're vaishnavas and we if yeah. someone's washing the dishes they're a vaishnav yeah. if someone's managing the temple they're a vaishnav if someone's giving class they're a vaishnav and we 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 don't want to try to put them in a little box of being a brahman chatriya vaishya sudha but nevertheless that function is a chatriya function yes and as we see even in secular history good kings supported the intellectuals you know like the, the thinkers of the world uh, uh and aristotle and, and whoever you know doing their research and things the kings would support them and they would support the artists and that would enable those thinkers to be like childlike persons and they didn't have to get involved in all the politics and fault finding or this or that and and practically never were those kings perfect persons <laughs> they always had faults but they were doing some noble thing and and that's a, that's an important thing to 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 bear in mind yeah. so um repeat what you asked me again at the last point i'm sorry yeah you know just one more i will respond to that before i move on i was thinking that when you talked about god supports the organized religion you know we could say from the bhagavatam's perspective the brahmanas also represent organized religion and the vaishnavas are devotees so quite often the bhagavatam depicts that the vaishnavas are superior to the brahmanas yes how many past times but still in none of in hardly any past time are the brahmanas condemned yes. so for example shukracharya he actually gives advice against surrendering to vishnu but still at the end Uh, which Lord Vishnu very respectfully asked Shukracharya, you know, what was wrong in his sacrifice? <laughs> and, and he doesn't say that you know you rejected you. Con- he doesn't condemn him. So the Bhagavatam also actually, is, uh, in the sense, respects uh, the the representatives of organized religion. The Brahmanas, even if they are wrong, the Brahmanas are not rejected or condemned or even publicly criticized. They are allowed to. we could say save face they are not disgraced mm-hmm. very good yeah yeah it's a very very important thing yes, thank you so the question i had asked was that you know are there any particular reasons why people might perceive or, or even devotees might perceive the institution negatively and how can that be avoided because one side is as you said that we need space but we also need respect for the institution well first of all what is the institution again i've never spoke to iskon who is mr iskon i i've never heard anybody who talked to mr iskon and our experiences with iskon are relative and someone may have a good experience in chopati and someone may have a very bad experience in some other temple or vice versa Mm. and someone may say oh this temple this is iskon but they haven't been to every temple in the world and even if they did go to every temple well then even if somehow they met every devotee in the world would they really understand iskon even then because we can't understand the hearts and minds of other persons so when people become discouraged by iskon what does it mean it, it means that generally they they had a bad experience 
for some person. Usually, the office is more personal. personal. Yeah, usually when people talk about yeah. ISKCON, it's the office bearers of ISKCON. Somebody who officially represents ISKCON, people have bad, so have bad experiences. So I would say that for outsiders, it might be say some book distribution is very book distributor is very pushy, or for uh, for somebody who's already a devotee, the temple management may just re reject their reject their suggestions or force them to do a particular thing. Uh, so in that sense. Somebody is office bearer, so that uh, somebody who that person deals with them negatively, then they feel as if Iskon has uh, Iskon has treated me badly. Yes. So I, when I deal with that kind of thing, it depends on the person, of course. Mm -hmm. If it's an outside person on the street, and they say, "Oh, you guys are just a bunch of beggars going to the airport." begging money and trying to sell your books and, and you're too pushy. Oftentimes I'll tell them you're right. It's true. We've been too pushy in the past. There's been some people like that. We, we should be honest and acknowledge the faults in our society. If they're a genuine fault and we have a lot of genuine faults and it's not surprising. We're a, a young society, a lot of young members, passionate people. So I, I acknowledge that, but I tell them that's not everybody. I, I, I remember once the author of Monkey on a Stick, I don't know if you've heard of that book. It was a very, is it a, a Monkey on a Stick? It's a title. Yeah, Monkey on a Stick. It was an excuse and some of the terrible things that went on in New Vrindavan. And they had all kinds of worse things you can imagine. <laughs> and when they came to our particular area, I was a president there. I would go on. He, the author had a public interview with someone and our GBC and myself went and we were dressed as devotees. And at one point, somebody came down with a microphone and said, so you're Hare Krishna devotees. What do you think about what he's saying? And they pushed the microphone in our GBC member's face. And he said, such a good thing. He said, like a small child, he said, this is not why I joined this country. This is not what ISKCON is for me. There may be some people who are doing like this. There may be stool and urine on the Ganga. There may be dead bodies. But we have to distinguish. And for me, as Naranja Maharaj, I remember saying once in, in, a, a, me in a meeting with some leaders in Kazakhstan that we had the good fortune to be at, he told the devotees there, he said, believe me, I have every reason to leave ISKCON. I've been abused so many times. I've seen so many bad things. I have every reason to leave, but I stay because I know Srila Prabhupada's desire. It's very easy for devotees to become angry. Now we're speaking about devotees before we're speaking about outside people. And it's mm. very different how to deal with them. But speaking about devotees, I understand, I understand both why devotees, why non-devotees will become angry sometimes with our society with mistakes that have gone on. But I have no problem with the Holy Name. I have no problem with Srimad Bhagavatam. I have no problem with Prasadam. I have no problem with Srila Prabhupada or our previous Acharyas or, or this, this tradition. And I feel perfectly enriched and happy being part of it. And let me tell you a little story. So this story perfectly illustrates the point, I think. Some years ago, one senior devotee, very senior disciple, Srila Prabhupada, who was an acharya, uh, uh, sannyasi, but he left ISKCON, he had some affection for me. And he invited me one day to have prasadam with him. And so I went to his ashram, and we sat down and we had prasadam. And then he's speaking to me, and the whole purpose of his speaking to me, turned out, was he wanted to tell me how bad ISKCON was and why I should leave ISKCON and why I should go and work with him. Now, it was very hard for me to argue with him for several reasons, one of which is you'd have to know this person. Nobody defeats him in argument. He's extremely powerful. And the second reason is because what he was saying, the bad things he was saying about ISKCON, they were true. 
<laughs> so <laughs> what could I say? So I was quiet for like one hour. And he was going on and on saying so many things and I was just quiet. And finally he said, so what do you think? And I said, well, Maharaj, it's like Kurukshetra. And he said, Kurukshetra, what do you mean Kurukshetra? And I said, well, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta commented that at the end of his life, Thakur Bhaktivinoda wanted to go to Kurukshetra. And that when some people heard about that, they were horrified. What do you want to go to Kurukshetra for? You want to go to Radhakund? You want to go to Vamsivat, Govardhan? What do you want to go to Kurukshetra with his lakes of blood? And, and it, you don't want to go to Kurukshetra. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta responded, you're virus Sikh. You're not rest Sikh persons. You don't understand. Because Thakur Bhaktivinoda is a servant of Srimati Radharani. And that service, which is the most needed, is the most appreciated. And that's why Bhaktivinoda wanted to go to Kurukshetra. Because there at Kurukshetra, Srimati Radharani had the greatest need. There was Radhakon, Shamakon, Govardhan Hill. There were no gopis and gopas. Radharani's need was the greatest. And so that service, which is the most needed, is the most appreciated. And I turned to this sannyasi and I said, So Maharaj, that's why I stay in ISKCON. Because I see the problems. And I, I'm completely convinced that Srila Prabhupada will be very pleased with me if I stay and I try to solve the problem. And for me, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, there's no problem. There's really no problem. I, I give class whenever I want. I say whatever I want. I'm giving this interview, which may be very unpopular with some people. <laughs> I'm making trouble for it. Yeah. But I can do this. And, and I, I'm friends. I'm supporters of the leaders of GBC. Not every one of them. I'm a human being. But I'm friends with many of them. Not that they're all perfect or good or whatever, but I, I want to be a supporter of the mission. And there's no problem for me. I can have my artistic, intellectual expression, and I can choose my, my association. And if someone's obnoxious and, and, and stifling and, and trying to, to hinder my progress and trying to control me, well, I don't stay there. I go somewhere else, politely. <laughs> I don't waste my time arguing with them because life is too short. And, and this is something I've learned from my Guru Maharaj, who was, a, who was a great radical in our society. And to this day, some people are, are nervous about him and his mood. But at the same time, he was a staunch member of the GBC and a staunch member of ISKCON. And, and he, taught, he taught me personally, he taught the devotees that you should work with the society. I, I, I can understand why people feel hurt. We feel hurt because the outside devotees feel hurt. They don't like ISKCON for the same reason that the inside devotees feel hurt and don't like ISKCON. What is that broad reason? The broad reason is when we don't treat people as individuals, when we treat people in a mechanical way, and we're a book distributor, and our relationship with someone is, excuse me, sir, are you from here or from out of town? Great, you get one of these, here you go. And we're just saying something mechanically. We're not treating them like a person. And it makes them feel hurt. And in the same way, when I'm, I'm moving the temple, and someone just says, look, new bhakta, just shut up and, and be humble. Huh? And do what I tell you. Then we feel hurt. That we're not being acknowledged, but there's no trust in us. There's no acknowledgement that I'm an individual. So this is such an important thing. And, and this is a lacking of bhakti. Because when the bhakti is there, then we treat everyone as individuals. And there's no question of mechanical dealings. I, let me read something to you, Prabhuji. Is that okay? You want to comment on any of this? I spoke for a long time. No, no, please. You can. Okay. Okay. You can. You can complete that. I'll comment something. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to read some very, very heavy things. The first is from Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. He says, the idea of an organized church in an intelligible form indeed marks the close of the living spiritual movement. The great ecclesiastical establishments 
are the dikes and the dams to retain the current, meaning like the current of a river, that cannot be held by any such contrivances, any such methods. They indeed indicate a desire on the part of the masses to exploit a spiritual movement for their own purpose. They also unmistakably indicate the end of the absolute and unconventional guidance of the bona fide spiritual teacher. Now, this is a very heavy statement. Some people may feel disturbed by it, but this is a statement from our Parapara Gurudev, Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. And we won't do well if we just reject his statement because it makes us uncomfortable. In his language, in his words, he says, the church that has the best chance of survival in this damned world is that of atheism under the convenient guise of theism. The churches have always proved to be the staunchest upholders of the grossest form of worldliness from which even the worst of non-ecclesiastical criminals are found to recoil. And he says, it's not, don't mind me, don't be offended, please. He says, it's not from any deliberate opposition to the ordained clergy, the members of the church, that these observations are made. The original purpose of the established churches of the world may not always be objectionable, but no stable religious arrangement for instructing the masses has yet been successful. Wow. What, what a statement, my God. But so then what is this movement? And, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta saw this. And this, I wrote some article about this, uh, this some comments on this article, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. If he said this, then why did he make an institution? And why did Srila Prabhupada make an institution? My suggestion is because there were two secret weapons which they were very conscious of. And as long as those two secret weapons are there, then Putana, in the form of the false guru, and Kongsa, in the form of the head of mundane religion, will always be defeated. What are the two secret weapons? The Holy Name and Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, someone may scratch their head and say, excuse me, Prabhu, um, the Holy Name is not secret. We chant Hare Krishna on the street and Srimad Bhagavatam. We distribute that all over. They're secret. Because the Putin is a little Putin is and the little Kongsas don't take them seriously. Yeah. They take seriously a, an ecclesiastical position in the church. They take seriously money. Now I'd like to read something to you. I titled it Tradition versus Convention. We can go on. This is from a great thinker, secular thinking named Thomas Merton from his book, No Man is an Island. Now, bear in mind what we just read from Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta. This is almost like a commentary. This. He says, in, in actual fact, conventions are the death of real tradition. As they, are. <laughs> As they are of all real life. They are parasites which attach themselves to the living organism of tradition and devour all its reality, turning it into a hollow formality. Tradition is living and active, but convention is passive and dead. Tradition does not form us automatically. We have to work to understand it. But convention is accepted passively as a matter of routine. Therefore, convention easily becomes an evasion of reality. Beautiful. It offers us only pretended ways of solving the problems of living, a system of gestures and formalities. Tradition really teaches us to live and shows us how to take full responsibility for our lives. Thus, tradition is often flatly opposed to what is ordinary, to what is mere routine. But convention, which is a mere repetition of familiar routines, follows this is a line of least resistance. One goes through an act without trying to understand the meaning of it all, merely because everyone else does the same. Tradition, which for us, or I guess we would say parampara, tradition. Yeah. Tradition, which is always old, is at the same time ever new because it's always reviving, born again in each new generation to be lived and applied in a new and particular way. 
Convention is simply the ossification of social customs. <laughs> the activities of conventional people are merely excuses for not acting in a more integrally human way. Tradition nourishes the life of the spirit. Convention merely dis disguises its interior decay. <laughs> okay. This is, I'm sure you must have a few thoughts about some of these things. <laughs> no, this is stunning. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I should have taken what you suggested and responded to your earlier comments earlier, but there's a lot to discuss. Yes. So, but first point about what you said earlier, like this is not the ISKCON I joined, or this is not why I joined ISKCON. That is such a uh, honest and human way of responding to criticism. Because sometimes we just, uh, sometimes any kind of criticism is dismissed as blasphemy of devotees or blasphemy of guru and guru's movement. And then, you know, that will suppress any honest self-reflection or self-criticism. We also make mistakes and we need to learn from them. So, but at the same time, yeah, so we are not denying those mistakes, not denying that, but at the same time, we're saying well, that's not, that's not what attracted us What attracted us is something else. So that way I, I found that that level of honesty requires a humility because <laughs> just to some extent, you know, when you said, what is this con to that extent, there's also the question, how much do we identify with this con? Now, if we identify too much with this con, then immediately the criticism of his con appears like a personal attack. And then we may respond uh, at a knee jerk level. So we, but if we, we are mature, there is a, like a, not a very attached identification with this con, then we can also reflect honestly, or we can reflect calmly without feeling threatened. Yes, this is, this is a problem, but this is also there. So I think that honesty is very important. Otherwise we live in a state of denial. And then now in today's world, we cannot really survive like that because anybody can just go on Google and find every controversy that is there. Yeah. So, and in some ways, maybe it is better that we discuss honestly, otherwise people will get a distorted perception from other sources. And that could be a problem. So that was one point. And then the, regarding this, I had several thoughts about what you said in Bhaktivedanta Thakur. Do you have any idea when he wrote these quotes? Was it toward the end of his life? Because he seemed uh, somewhat disappointed by the way devotees were, were say, uh, competing for uh, like a privileged room and for some material facilities. Was it toward the end that he wrote these statements? Of that's an interesting question. Let me just look here. Um, uh, I th I'm thinking it was written in 1931. Somehow that's what's in my mind. But I'm just trying to find the, the date. Maybe I don't have it here. But it's it's a good point. Oh, it was published in 1932. Okay, 32. So now he started, if I'm not mistaken, he started that uh, Ultadanga temple in uh, 1919, isn't it? 1919 to 1920. That was the big year when he started off in Kolkata. Yes. And 1937 was the year when he departed. So this, you could say this is almost in the middle of his, uh, so he was still a very active part of the institution. And he, I mean, he was energizing and empowering the institution, but he was guarding against the uh, against the criticism, uh, guarding against the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. And then another point that when he, when he was saying this, he is not immediately qualifying it by saying that this doesn't apply to Gaudiya Mahat because we are transcendental. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so good. It's so important. He's speaking of the principle. Yeah. And we should always speak about the principle and not the person. Persons I don't understand. I don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but, but principles are important. 
Mm. So here, maybe this is a whole different subject to discuss, but it, in our tradition, the because we are a personal, because our philosophy is personal and bhakti is also a personal relationship. So there is a lot of emphasis on say the relationship between the disciple and the guru. So uh, then when there is a problem with the, with the behavior of a person, uh, that itself becomes very difficult. So you also made an earlier point that when, whenever anybody is, uh, anybody feels hurt, that's because they are treated mechanically. They're not treated like human beings. Mm -hmm. So this is from two perspectives now that say somebody in authority treats somebody impersonally or you know, sometimes I, I use the word instrumentally. That means you just treat the person as a tool to get something done. And if you are, if you don't conform to the way I expect things to be, then, then get out of my way. Uh, then that person becomes uh, rejected or even demonized sometimes. So, so from that perspective, the, the, the people in position may treat somebody uh, in a way that is not respecting their humanity or their individuality. But on the other side, the devotees are also told that your inspiration has to come from other devotees. So, for example, we say that bhakti sanjayate bhakti. The bhakti comes from the bhaktas. So, now at the same time, so how do you differentiate between the principle and the person? Because we are told we have to surrender to a person. Or we surrender to the person because that person is manifesting that principle. Is it how we put it? I think that the nature of a neophyte is they can't distinguish. It's very hard for them. And they need to have some kind of designation, some kind of upadi, just like someone goes to the, the uh, fashion, the, the mall, and they buy clothes off the rack to give themselves an identity. And mm -hmm. so also we have ISKCON as our identity. But I'm not ISKCON. You're not ISKCON. Who is ISKCON? ISKCON is not a person. It could have been the League of Devotees. But there is Srila Prabhupada's Seva Sangha. Mm -hmm. That I identify with. But if someone comes and complains about ISKCON, I can be as detached as they are, depending on who it is and how they're criticizing. But I can, I can acknowledge, as you pointed out, in a humble way, in an honest way, you're right. Because it, it's not a reflection on me, because I don't feel that I am ISKCON. I'm not accepting that upadi. Rather, I'm a servant of ISKCON. I'm a servant of Srila Prabhupada's Seva Sangha. I'm always an individual. So that's an important principle. If we lose that understanding of our individuality, then, then it's very difficult. So, so for neophyte devotees, it's hard for them because they're not mature enough to have any kind of idea about themselves as an individual. So often, I mean, it, 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 that's a gross generalization. Sometimes I've seen new devotees who are very mature and very individual and i've also seen older devotees who are very mechanical and rigid and institutional and wrapping themselves up in, in, in designations okay so i am not as con is a you know it is a very obviously we are not as con con is much bigger than us but uh, at the same time we need to have that differentiation. So when you say that this Prabhupada Seva Sangha, is this something which you coined? It's a beautiful construction. It's That's a, my phrase. And okay. that means, what is Prabhupada Seva Sangha? That's the real ISKCON. And, yeah. that, and, that, and that doesn't just mean leaving the managers and whatever. Sometimes devotees say that Prabhupada said, I am ISKCON. Right? But Prabhupada also said, I, and I, I, you can't find that in the folio, but I, but I take it, I accept that Prabhupada said it sometime. But Prabhupada many times, Prabhupada may have said, I'm, I am Iskand, but Prabhupada many times said, Is, Prabhupada said, Iskand's my body, excuse me, Iskand's yeah. my body. Yeah. But Prabhupada many times said, I'm not my body. I am not my body, yeah. <laughs> 
And Prabhupada told Brahmananda, it's in his remembrances. When I read this, it, it blew my mind. They were in Los Angeles. There was some miscom politics going on. And one day Prabhupada turned to Brahmananda and said, I'm leaving ISKCON. I'm going to leave ISKCON. And Brahmananda was completely shocked. He said, but, 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 but Prabhupada, you are ISKCON. <laughs> Brother said, never mind, I'm going to leave. <laughs> so what does it mean? How Prabhupada can't leave ISKCON. ISKCON is Prabhupada's desire. That's what I see as ISKCON. And there's certain box for that, that that's called the management and the buildings and the temples and properties and all that. And that box is needed, and we should take good care of the box. But the gift inside, let's talk about that. This is what Srila Prabhupada's desire. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada told the GBC, if I didn't say this last session, I definitely should say it at least once this time. He, he walked into a GBC meeting. This is in a Prabhupada Lilamrita. And he told them, everybody stopped and looked up to him. Prabhupada said, this chanting should go on. Instead of meetings, resolutions, dissolutions, revolutions, and no solutions, there should be chanting. This is the Hare Krishna movement. And this is a solution. There's a beautiful remembrance we saw from Mahatma Prabhu, who was a temple president in, I don't know, 1974 in uh, Vancouver. And he came to uh, the San Francisco Rathiatra. And when he was there, he was informed that there was going to be a meeting of all the temple presidents with Srila Prabhupada. And so he was thinking, wow, I, I've seen Prabhupada in morning walks. I've seen Prabhupada give him class. I've seen Prabhupada in Rathiatra but I've never seen Prabhupada as a manager. I want to see what, what he's like as a manager. <laughs> so he went to the meeting, right? And Prabhupada, the first thing he did, he gave everybody prasadam. He just greeted everybody in a very informal, loving, personal way. And then he just started talking to them about preaching. And there was nothing about management. And Mahatma was waiting, when is he going to talk to us about the accounts? and how to organize this and that, but there was nothing. And he said over the many years of his association with Prabhupada, he never saw Prabhupada doing management like that. And another point he made I thought was very interesting. He said, as managers, we all have crises. I mean, there's, uh, there's, every GBC member, you, you ask him practically every second or third day, they get a phone call, there's this crisis, Maharaj, there's things going on, <laughs> this problem and this. And we're always trying to scramble. There's always emergencies. I can't go to Bhagavatam class today because this crisis is there with, with the New York temple or with this thing or that thing. Right? I can't do that. But Prabhupada never had a crisis. <laughs> there was no crisis situations for Srila Prabhupada. He was just taking shelter of bhakti. And that was how Mahatma said it was amazing. Here's someone who has over 100 temples all over the world over 10,000 disciples, and he's writing, written and writing books constantly. He's managing a worldwide movement with all kinds of accounts and monies and, and management things going on. And he doesn't have a, a, a fleet of secretaries and telephones. And he very rarely used the telephone. And what was his management style? Prabhupada's my hero. <laughs> he's my management hero. <laughs> That's beautiful. True. If I may just present a slightly different perspective. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I've, been, I've been reading uh, uh, Giriraj Maharaj. Giriraj Maharaj has just completed a book on the Juhu Temple. Oh. It's not yet published, but it's a magnificent book, more than 600 pages. So actually there, in many ways, we see Srila Prabhupada as the manager. Uh -huh. in, in a sense that Prabhupada was involved. Okay, have, have this... Uh, you know, how much did you pay for the cement? How much did you do for this? Prabhupada would actually scrutinize things also. And, uh, and then we see Prabhupada was quite, uh, uh, we could say, he would change strategies. At one time, when the, local, when, when the local government said that this temple is a nuisance and uh, we should not be, we don't want it because it's too much noise. So Prabhupada said, we will get all our patrons, we'll all get all supporters and we will do a dharana. We will do a protest march against it. And then after that, Prabhupada said, no, maybe a protest march is not a good idea. We don't want, because we have to live with the government. We don't want to antagonize the government. He said, we'll just, we will contact our life members and uh, we will uh, find through them if we can influence the government to change his decision. So the, the point I was making here is two points. 
that uh, that when it was necessary prabhupad could do management and prabhupad in fact the way prabhupad dealt with the juhu case you know when the person when mr n was trying to take the temple away after taking the money also prabhupad like a warrior trying to make to protect the temple so prabhupad would do that when it was necessary and especially in india he felt it was necessary because in india often western devotees were cheated they had to pay too much indians thought that western people are loaded with money so they would take too much money but when he had the option especially after the initial few years in the west prabhupa did not get much involved in management now he more or less entrusted uh, his disciples to his disciples the responsibility of managing so so the second point i wanted to make here was that uh, first was that prabhupa preferred not to manage but if required he was ready to step forward and do that also for krishna and second is when he came to management he did not treat even his own decisions as absolute i told this so this is is not like this decision is the word of god's representative and you have to accept it no i thought of this today and no this is not working let's try this out so in that sense if prabhupad also did not approach management with a with the attitude of divine omniscience then if we are dealing with managers we can't expect them to be perfect that sometimes they may make mistakes and there's a lot of pressure in management and that leads to different kinds of uh, maybe lack of judgment or impulsive decisions or so many things can happen because it is a it is like a pressure cooker situation there's a lot of pressure in that service so in any Friends. Managers need friends, and they need someone who's thoughtful, and they need sadhus who are detached and are not political, and not trying to just bash them or hate managers because all managers are bad, which is such a childish thing to say. I, I find it very shallow. I'm sorry to say, I find it very shallow when people just complain about ISKCON, the institution. I find it a very shallow statement because. it means you're being institution it means you're being a uh, shallow like that because i'm not an institution you're not an institution the people here in the room with me right now they're not an institution i don't want to treat them like that why now i may be unhappy with xyz gbc member or temple president i may disagree with their policy or something that's may be there but why do i want to take away the personality and individuality of so many people in in speak in an impersonal kind of way and just lump everybody in and say it's all bad that's a very shallow that's a symptom of a shallow thinker a shallow person far better too with these managers as you said i find so many of the time they really need a friend they need some help and if you love them and care for them it touches their heart and 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 they're they're not the times they're very eager to take advice but if you just want to go like everybody else and just start lecturing them <laughs> without showing that you have love and affection for them if you haven't earned their trust yeah then they're very guarded and they're thinking oh here's another person doing politics and this and that and oh god and, and it's so painful for them we really need managers there's so many managers you know uh, the temple president in detroit was one famous example he wasn't chanting 16 rounds he wasn't following four principles and the devotees revolted against him and and they wanted him out they finally kicked him out and prabhu came and prabhu brought him back and the devotees complained and they wanted to kick him out again and prabhu said no he's a good manager <laughs> and maybe he wasn't such a a good disciple in his way whatever but he had some good qualities and prabhu saw that to be a good manager is such an important thing Now it means he's friends with Kongso. You know, there's, there's saintly persons who are friends with Robin and, and so many demoniac persons, not because they like those demons, but because they have an important position. And let me try to be their friend and give them some good advice if I can. But but they'll they may accept us as a friend, just like Kongso accepted Narad Muni because 
he really considered Narada Muni was a non-political person. He was a detached kind of person. Mm -hmm. I really like, by the way, your comment. It was a kind of correction in a way, and I'm delighted with it. Uh, Giri Raj Maharaj's remembrance of Prabhupada. Thank you. That, that makes things a lot more balanced. It's not just that we're hippies and, and, and Prab, but at the same time, I think Prabhupada didn't, he didn't, personally, he didn't want to take that role. Yeah. But in, in India, as you pointed out, he, there was one big manager who said, Prabhupada, I, 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 I'm not able to chant my rounds properly and do this. And Prabhupada said, <laughs> never mind your rounds. You just do this service. I'm telling you to do this. But he wasn't able to do it. It was too much for the Westerners. I know very well for a Westerner being in India, it's very difficult. It's like you feel like sometimes everybody's trying to cheat me. <laughs> Once somebody told that to Prabhupada, famous conversations, the Western devotees said, Prabhupada, all the Indians are trying to cheat us. And Prabhupada said, yes, I'm also an Indian. <laughs> I'm also cheating you. <laughs> I told you, it's such a fun, easy thing, chant, dance, and be happy. And then you come, and then you find out about four regulated principles. You said them this way, I cheated you also. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we really, I, I think what we need, Prabhuji, we need community, and we need love and trust. And this is, for me, this is a path I want to see with ISKCON. I want to see ISKCON continue. I want to see the properties continue. I want to see the temples continue and the management continue. But all of that's just the box. And the heart of the box is loving Vaishnav exchanges. It's our community. And it's artificial for me to just say, I love everybody. If you're an ISKCON devotee, I love you. That means I'm not very mature. It means I, I'm sentimental. It, it means something impersonal because the only, to love everybody means you love nobody. But I love people because of their qualities, because of the interaction with them. So I should find that place, whether it's the Govran Echo Village or it's Chopati or whether it's Bhuvaneshwar or Mayapur, wherever, where I have my Sangha, where people love and trust me and I can get responsibility and I can be empowered. We need that. Mm, beautiful. Yes, bro. We just uh, thought of that to love everybody is to actually love nobody. There's an American comedian who said that, you know, I love humanity. It is just human beings with whom I have a problem. <laughs> 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 so I think it's uh, if we don't differentiate, then we will not be able to actually connect deeply with anyone because. We might superficially say, I like all devotees, which is fine. We don't want to dislike devotees, of course. But if you want to go deep, we, we'll have to find out who are like-minded. And uh, finding that out at each place or whichever places we get our Sangha, that's important. You know, going back a little bit earlier, you said that you go to each temple when you go, you try to understand the mood of that temple. And then you try to see how your presentations can fit into the mood. So now there is, there are two distinct things in this. Uh, I'll give two examples of this and then maybe you could comment on this that you know, I once said at one temple gave a class and then the devotee came and he said, your class was wonderful. Then I asked him, what did you like in the class? So he says, it was not, it, there was no contamination of any management agenda in the class. <laughs> there was no contamination of any management agenda. Okay. On the other hand, there was, I went to a temple and then the temple leader told me that we need to, that we need to, uh, the devotees are not coming forward to do services. So uh, therefore, uh, we, the devotees are eager to do services like pujari on the altar or giving classes. But say cleaning temples and thing, clean temple hall, washing vessels, you would not ready to come and do how to do that service. So then can you speak on this topic? So then I spoke on that topic about how for Krishna, you know, all services uh, are dear to him and we can serve him in various ways. Then one devotee came and told me that 
there had been a preacher who had come for the last previous day and there had been a preacher who had come the previous week and they said how come all three of you spoke on the same topic <laughs> 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 it's like I think in our last session maybe I mentioned about the artist that I'd met who asked me what I thought of her paintings and I did something I usually don't do and I said well actually to tell you the truth I, I'm not I don't, they don't really touch my heart I'm not impressed and she said really? I also don't like them yeah they told me exactly what to do and so I, I, I find the same problem when we travel sometimes people they want to use you and they're not treating you like a person. They're trying to use you as an instrument, as you would say, for their own particular agenda. And that's a kind of violence against you. It's violence in the sense that they're stripping you of some of your individuality and personality. And they're, they're also stripping other devotees of that and just demanding that they follow them, whatever, follow their you know, management. It's painful. And it requires some expertise. And sometimes uh, Prabhupada would flatter people. My grandma once told me, Madhav Nanda, he said, you should learn how to cheat them. It's very important. <laughs> and, and what he meant by that, I would see how he would cheat people sometimes. He would flatter some people. And Prabhupada flattered some people. And he would say, oh, you're like an incarnation. You're like this, this and that. To get them to cooperate, to get them to work together. So it's one thing to flatter someone, but the saying is there I like very much that, that empathy is not the same thing as endorsement. I may empathize you with someone. It's a very important point, but I'm not necessarily endorsing what you're doing. And that, that again, is something which requires maturity. And it, these are just growing pains that we're talking about. And I, I very much hope that anybody watching this discussion between us doesn't get the wrong idea and think that either you or myself are against ISKCON or against the institution. I, I, I think nothing further from the truth. Both of us have dedicated our life to Prabhupada's mission. But my life is not given to an institution. <laughs> my life's given to a Seva Sangha and the teachings of Prabhupada. And I also help serve the box that those things come in but the box is secondary for me and the gift inside is the primary thing yeah i think coming back to that example is important and uh, i love this difference between empathy and endorsement so you know we could uh, say for example if there is some manager who is facing a lot of problems because of a particular devotee and conversely, that devotee is facing a lot of problems because of that manager. <laughs> <laughs> so in both ways, so you know, we, could, we could offer them a caring, uh, attentive ear and a caring heart, but we don't have to endorse anyone mm -hmm. in that sense. We can, so that's a, that's a very, it's very good, uh, you could say. I think in Chaitanya Bhagavat, isn't there a passage where, where Rindanda Chakur says that, if two groups of Vaishnavas are fighting, then uh -huh. don't take sides. Yes. Uh, I think that that may not be like a absolute statement at all situations, but it is a it is a good advice. It is a good principle, and I think that might go echoes with what you are saying of uh, em being empathic but not endorsing. The institution is always going to have little different forms. As we travel, and it's a Bhakti Rasamrita Maharaj was telling me a few years ago, I, I was saying something about how uh, it's healthy to have traveling preachers because they're not, they don't know the politics, they're not attached to a place, and then they can go somewhere and people have faith in them, unless you speak the same thing the last three speakers also spoke. <laughs> 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 because the temple president's coercing you. But it's good because it's a fresh person and they're not in both sides that there's two different parties and it always happens that we have the phrase gramya kata gramya kata means in the gram in the village that's what happens when you live together but then you have a visiting preacher or sannyasin and their qualifications they're not attached to either side so i was telling this about you rasamrita Maharaj, 
And he liked that. And then he told me, he said, and the other thing is, it's very good for the preachers because you get to go and you see so many different ways that people are spreading Christian consciousness. And I, it was such a profound comment for me. I, I always remember that. And I, 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 it's, it's one of the most valuable things in my life. When I travel, I always look to see how different devotees in different temples are doing things because the box comes in different colors. It comes in different shapes. Sometimes hard, sometimes it's soft. And in so many different ways, the box comes. And, and it's, the box is interesting. The box is important. And then also the gift inside. Some people, they, they shine it in, in a particular way. It comes in a particular color in the inside gift also. And we can learn so much from that. But when we demand, when we have this, this idea, instead of, as Thomas Merton was saying, let's go back to that, instead of uh, following our tradition, our parampara, we just have convention and we're just repeating something in a blind mechanical kind of way, then we lose the essence. And this is what Bhaktivinod spoke about, saragrahi and baravahi, the essence seekers and the persons carrying the heavy load. That's so true. And so, you know, this the same point about the variety we see within within the movement itself in each temple. Each temple has a different mood. And there are, although they are doing the core same core activities, but so in a sense, within the institution itself, we, we see individuality flourishing. So each temple, we could say, is the manifestation of the mood of its leader, or whoever, whether it could be the temple president, or it could be the spiritual master, or whoever is there, usually. But, so in that sense, it's not that the individual always, the institution always suppresses the individuality. So Prabhupada, sometimes I use this word, maybe there might be a better word, I say that ISKCON is like a uh, joint, is like a set of joint nuclear families. <laughs> Join I like that. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> so each, each temple is like a nuclear family, but then it's joint. So, <clears throat> so that means uh, individuality does flourish for those who take up responsibility. And if they're ready to take up responsibility, they get empowerment. And once they get the empowerment, then they can develop their individuality even through the way the way each temple manifests. So the striking thing to me in this regard too, you look at every single leader in our society, they're an individual. And the reason why they're leaders is because they're a strong individual. So if in a subtle way, we're trying to discourage individuality, it doesn't work because all the leaders are the persons who are the great individuals. Yeah, <laughs> it's required to be mature enough to balance these two things. Yes, and I see artists who have money people, people who are buying their paintings because someone, a money person, will buy a painting from you for a thousand rupees and then turn around and sell it for ten thousand rupees, and the artist feels angry and cheated. Because the artist doesn't have a brain for money, generally speaking. That's, that's the way artists work. They're, they're just idealistic persons. Thinkers are like that. They're idealistic persons. And it's natural, sometimes a very common thing amongst artists and intellectuals to be angry and distrustful of managers or financial people because they, they've, they've been cheated. And they think all these people are like this. But it's, it's necessary to find good, honest managers and financial people because the intellectuals, the Brahmins, they're like children. The artists are like children. And, and, and their, their, their childlike nature is there because they're, they're, they're not putting their mind so much toward money and toward external things. And therefore, they can explore the world of creativity and thought. And we want to support that from them. And that's why the Brahmins are, are supported by the Vaishyas and, and the Kshatriyas and, and other persons. It's important. Hmm. Beautiful. Now this, again, this point about Brahmanas or artists being like children, 
that's such an important point in one sense that's what is required for them to do their role if say an artist becomes very calculative or then they, they cannot even do art properly yes so if the if somebody is just making the art that is going to sell then it's not really art it's more of a business and same way with um, with brahmanas also so they're better to say vaishnavas i think than brahmanas yeah and when they when they fall down and they become mechanical then that's a brahman <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it yeah so but so, so somebody is playing a brahmanical role in society and by being a vaishnava so now now i would like to outline some dynamics so that uh, if somebody so there could be individual institution broadly there could be three possibilities say so one is that the individual grows and makes the institution grow that means that individual becomes a institution's leader it's so like some temp- some devotees they come they join they become they distribute books they become sankirtan leaders then they be- they become a temple president or they start their own temple so for those kind of people who become institutional leaders for them expressing their individuality is not a problem but there could be some people who do not become institutional leaders in the sense of the institution's hierarchy and then for them to develop their individuality into institution becomes difficult so some people individ they grow individually and they make the institution grow but some people they may find it difficult to grow because of the institution or because of the institutional constraints and that the third kind of people they grow simply because of the institution that means <laughs> they don't really make the institution grow so much so with no no offense to anyone but say if we have in a temple every day different devotees give classes so now now some devotees may be really very good speakers they not just good speakers but they may be good scholars and there may be some who may not be that good so now if that devotee were doing a program on their own not many people might come for their program but when that devotee gives a bhagavatam class then because it's a bhagavatam class so devotees come for that class so similarly say so some if uh, somebody becomes senior and just because somebody is senior they are made into a manager now they may not have the competence for managership but they grow simply because so they grow but they don't really make the institution grow hmm? because they are growing because of their seniority and they get some position so somebody is senior and then they are asked to do kirtans they are they may not be like very good at singing nor might they be very advanced devotees so that their, their devotion that their kirtan is surcharged with devotion so now if these three categories if i may repeat that those who themselves grow and make the institution grow those who can't grow because of the institution or those who can't grow within the institution say somebody wants to do some maybe do some service with painting or some other service which is not institutionally productive and some people who grow simply because of the institution mm. so so my observation is that to some extent the biggest problems come because of this middle category mm. those devotees are in the first category in the second category the first they will themselves grow they will make the institution grow the second category they will find their own space they will have to create their own space uh maybe have their own time and have their own resources so then create their own space and move forward but this third category that means they don't have any core competency and their qualification is only their seniority mm. then sometimes that would that could be what thomas merton says that somebody has simply followed a convention but they have not really internalized then sometimes these people become very rigid mm. so they feel that uh, because if somebody has competence then they they may see that competence is a threat to them 
and then that's where i think the problems come because the first and the second those both of them will be able to move forward in their own way but the third category can stop both the first and the third first and the second to move mm, any thoughts about this yes i i i i like your analogy your your analysis and i quite agree with it i i think it's really important for thinkers and artists to know how to deal with the third category and if they want to be able to continue with their art with their freedom of thinking and things they should be mature enough to understand that there's a lot of people who are mechanical in their in their behavior and i'm going to have to be very careful with them it it's a it's a sad thing today in our society i i see i i read i i i've met a lot of proper disciples when i traveled i remember there's one devotee i traveled with for a couple of days during sankirtan and he hadn't taken bath in like a month or two weeks or something like that and his body odor was so bad i had to have my head out the window while i was driving the car because i would just get sick it was just so toxic and later i saw him he he we stayed the night in the van he left and came back smoking a cigarette smelling like alcohol and it's a very this is a very gross example but my point is that no one today could know how to deal with him the prampa could deal with him prampa could still love him prampa could still engage him I see this a lot of times and speak in a very blunt way it's a little social difference I'm coming from America in America gay the gay people are very calm and homosexual and lesbians are very calm mm. in India it's not such a, it's there but it's not spoken of so much in India if you have someone who becomes interested in Krishna consciousness but they've got a girlfriend a lot of times a brahmachari in the temple doesn't know how to preach to them and what to speak if if they have a boyfriend <laughs> and, and they want to practice krishna consciousness because they don't fit <laughs> in, in the kind of box that we're used to but shila prabhupad was such a personality and i'm appreciating your your comments about these three different types of persons and in the second category i see people during the time of prabhupad there was a number of devotees including including at one time Tamal Krishna Maharaj and uh Vishnu Chandra Maharaj who were two of the biggest devotees in the society later but they they were very independent with the Radha Damodar party they just did what they wanted and Prabhupada let them do that Jayananda Prabhu who wasn't a, a, for a short time he was a temple president in San Francisco but mostly he was just a mature person who had a vision and he worked very hard hard for a spiritual master and he didn't exactly fit with any institutional role jamuna was another person who was very very artistic and very very thoughtful but she didn't really fit in in fact there's a conversation you can see in her biography where some of the leaders came to prabhupada and they accused her of being being a trick which is what we were speaking about in the last session that's uh bhagavatam 329 8 Dina Drick is a separatist. Yeah, that's a proper she's a separatist because she doesn't because she wasn't following everything that they gave. And Prabhupada and and they said she's not working with this and the proper said anywhere there are two people or more chanting Hari Krishna that is this guy. <laughs> wow. That's and he said she is this guy. Of course Prabhupada also said some other different things. But Prabhupada considered Jamuna to be very much his guy. although she didn't fit in any particular role i personally spoke with her about this it was a long discussion our, our conversation that which i is something i'll keep with me for the rest of my life very some many, many profound things i asked her because i respected her as an artist a thinker as an individual i said what happened i heard about the early days and there was one bathroom and everybody wore the same yellow cloth the only the ladies wore like a sari and the men wore like a dhoti and everybody used the same bathroom and the women gave class and the men gave class and what happened and she began to speak something about the history of things and that's a long discussion but at one point she couldn't tolerate it anymore and she loved shila prabhupada and prabhupada loved her and prabhupada would have her sit on the stage next to him and sing and, and sometimes give talks and things 
But when things became, uh, in the language of Thomas Merton, more conventional and more mechanical, and devotees started in a certain role, and it was all based on Upadis, that's when she checked out because it was too painful for her. And she came back to America, and she moved initially to Northern California and then later to Oregon. And she had with her Dina, uh, Dina Tarni Mataji, her old friend. And the two of them were ISKCON. And they had their deities of Radha Krishna, and they were cooking for Prabhupada. And, but, and she was a complete ISKCON devotee, completely dedicated to Prabhupada, but she wasn't working with the institution. And in my humble opinion, this is my personal opinion, but I consider Jamuna to be one of the great Acharyas in our ISKCON line, one of the great saints, who's a great, great example. But she's someone who didn't work exactly within the, the, the box of the institution always. And I don't think it's always necessary, that's my point. <clears throat> my God. So all oh, this is... I think these are examples which we really uh, need to maybe study and analyze a little bit more. Those devotees who with special artistic abilities couldn't or because they couldn't fit into the ISKCON, how Prabhupada dealt with them. That is, you know, her memoir is also quite moving. Uh, the, the book about her life, it is. So <clears throat> two points about this specifically that uh, he said about the second category needs to deal with the third category properly. So that means those who need their independence, but don't get it within the institution. So sometimes I tell devotees that if, if you want to do something, there are two things which we will never, we will rarely get together. There is freedom and there are facilities. <laughs> <laughs> freedom and facility. Okay. So if you want your freedom, then don't expect facilities. <laughs> Create your own facilities. And if you want facilities, then you may not have your freedom. At least you have to subordinate it to some extent. And we see this right from the time of Shri Prabhupada himself. You know, Prabhupada did not get any facilities from Gaudiya Mat. and But he, he had the freedom. And then he created the facilities. So... I feel if the expectations are moderated, quite often the complaining happens when we want the freedom and the facilities both. And we think, why am I not getting it? But in general, if somebody wants freedom, if the world is so big and in a sense, ISKCON is so small that as compared to the how big the world is, that is some devotees want to do something, they want the freedom to do something, it's very rare that somebody will go on their case and suppress them. So it's only when freedom and facility freedom is wanted and then facilities are also sought for that purpose. So then it becomes a problem. So just to give an example of this, that uh, <clears throat> say if somebody that like even you for yourself, you, know, you do Krishna Katha Amrut Bindu, if you had stayed in a temple then you wouldn't have had the had the facility to do this. But then when you had the freedom, I think it must it took few years to say create the resources. You had to go through a phase where I think once we were in Puri, you mentioned it to me. You, know, you had to you had to go through a phase of like total dependence on Krishna of how the resources were going to come. And then Krishna eventually provided the resources by which you could continue. So it's only I think when we expect both. So if the individual expects both, it's going to be a problem. And if the institutional leaders deny both, then it will be a problem. But if there is a moder if there is a mo if there are, the expectations are moderated, I mean the expectations are moderate, then there can be space for everyone to practice bhakti. And we should also understand, I think, too, that we have to earn respect. We have to earn trust. When we speak about freedom and facility, if you're a new devotee and you haven't earned the trust of the leaders, they're not going to want to give you freedom or facility. But if you're someone like Genevieve Harrison, who we mentioned in our last session also, uh, who, who by dint of her dedication, she's earned the trust of many devotees. And so she's gotten some facility and some freedom, although 
now she's getting her own facility. And you're saying, yeah, this is one of our purposes for our project, our Gopal Jew publications. I think it's one of the purposes of your publications also. Uh, you're doing different things in your publications in some ways than we are, but in general, we're trying to encourage people to think. And I'm trying to uh, do something for devotees which is out of the box. It's not totally rigid with the institution. And we like, we have our curriculum as in Puri where devotees can come and, and there's no big management, GBC, temple president thing. It's just hearing and chanting. And everything is based on that. And that's very, very nourishing. And we're fortunate to, to, to have some opportunity to do that. But to do that has taken me I, as an individual uh, 35 years of, of, of working to earn the trust of devotees. It's not something which just happened overnight. I often hear some of my intellectual friends complaining, artistic friends complaining, oh, they're so mechanical, and then they're not giving me any freedom, they're not giving me any facility, this and this. Well, we, two things are there. One is we should be ready to earn that. We should be ready to respect the devotees and, and when we have to earn their trust and the second thing is, if someone's just completely unreasonable, then go somewhere else where you're appreciated. This is what I love about ISKCON today. I, I remember there was one senior preacher, sannyasi guru, who uh, they requested him at a certain place in, in the world. I won't say names. They said, Maharaj, we love you, but maybe it's better if you don't come here because we have a very different mood. And two of the temple presidents in that area contacted him and asked him not to come and some of his followers became very angry and they said this is a great offense here but i i thought of that why is it an offense for me as an individual preacher if someone doesn't want me i think that's their good intelligence uh, they understand what i'm like and therefore they don't want me to go there they see my bad qualities why should anyone want me and, and why should i want to go there if I'm not wanted, life is too short to, to go and, and, and dance with those people. Let me go where I'm appreciated. If, if, so these two scenarios are there. And one is if I can earn the love and trust of those devotees and work with them. And if I can't because they're completely unreasonable, then go somewhere else. It's a big world. And people will appreciate your sincerity. I have full confidence in that. People don't appreciate politics and fault finding. But if you're a genuine, sincere person, you really want to help Prabhupada's mission, people will love you and they'll see that. We have to, in that sense, I feel strongly that we have to create community. I was having a discussion with a senior devotee about this recently and telling him how, how I find this in my own life, that wherever I go, I'm always trying to create community. And not just so that they go and give a class in the temple to 100 people and it's great and they clap their hands and say, wow, wonderful, and they maybe throw money at you or something. But I want to make friends and have a, a dinner program with three or four intimate persons and have a discussion like I'm having with you right now. And wherever we go, I, I'm always looking for like-minded devotees where we can come together in a small group because I need that. I need that nourishment. And I don't find that in a big temple, even if they all clap their hands and say, wow, that was a great class <laughs> or whatever. It's not satisfying in my heart to just be a, what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati called a platform preacher. You're not going to change the heart of people. We have to, to get to know individuals. And it, it's a disease when we can't see the individual because all we see is the institution. And then we start judging everybody by, oh, he's a senior person in the institution. Oh, he's a temple devotee in the institution. He's an outside devotee in the institution. He's a brahmachari in the institution. He's a grihasta in the institution, but he's a good grihasta. Or he's a grihasta who's independent. That's not good. Or, oh, my God, he's a babaji. Or he's a Gaudiya Mutt devotee. Or he's a Christian. I, I'll say this very frankly. I, I make better friends sometimes with Christians and even with Muslims. There was a Muslim couple who came to Jagannath Puri, and we made such good friends with them. 
I may be better friends with them sometimes than I am with some of my own God brothers. Because friendship is not just based on and then having the same guru or being in the same institution. Empathy doesn't indicate and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, the same as endorsement just because I'm friends with someone. But that friendship doesn't know any rules. I can be friends with someone and I can be myself. But sometimes we're not mature enough for that. But Prabhupada was. Prabhupada was friends with uh, Dr. Mishra who was a hardcore Mayavadi. When Dr. Mishra came to London, you know, Prabhupada's got his institution, everything's, he's become a lot more successful. He doesn't need Dr. Mishra anymore, as he did perhaps in New York, right? Dr. Mishra comes to New York, Prabhupada comes to London, Prabhupada immediately invited him for lunch and was so loving with him. My old friend, how are you doing? But Dr. Mishra is a Mayavadi. <laughs> How can he be friends with him? And Allen Ginsberg, Prabhupada was friends with Allen Ginsberg is a drug addict, homosexual, decadent person. But Prabhupada was friends with him. Friendship doesn't know rules. <laughs> Beautiful, huh? Friendship doesn't know rules. That's amazing. And the examples that you give are very, very... Poignant. I think sometimes uh, this is where uh, we may lose our humanity in trying to stick to rules. Rules are important, but if sometimes in sticking to rules, we may lose our humanity. You know, uh, maybe this is a whole different subject. Maybe we may have to discuss this in future, but I just mentioned this. that I was talking with one devotee and they said that you know, maybe they had some problem with one of the regulatory principles. And then it was uh, their guides or their authorities were, they came like a thunderbolt on them and that you are, uh, you have no sense control, you are a lusty animal and this and that. That is not a very serious thing. Like you, know, you said in India, even for a person to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, uh, just even a girlfriend is also considered quite scandalous sometimes. So it is something like that. And this devotee uh, told me afterward that, uh, you know, ISKCON is only a place for devotees. It is not a place for human beings. <laughs> That's a beautiful comment. <laughs> I don't want to be part of that, ISKCON. <laughs> but, but, but you know something, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu? I belong to another ISKCON. And I have a lot of friends. You're one of my friends. I and there's so many thinkers and artists and individuals that I'm friends with and we're ISKCON devotees and, and I'm very happy it depends on what, which direction you're looking at you know, the cup is half full or it's half empty right? yeah of course let me tell you a little yeah this is a, story, a beautiful story to illustrate your point that Radhanath Maharaj personally told me I don't know where he heard this, but uh, it, it's, it was an exchange between Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati and his disciple Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj. And it, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj was a temple president in some temple. And uh, there was a brahmachari who fell down with a girl. And so they came and made a complaint to Srila Bhaktisiddhanta. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta was a very heavy person. He called for that brahmachari. And he told him, you can go wherever you want, but you can't stay here. And the brahmachari began crying. Guru Maharaj, please, please, I have nowhere to go. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta said, out, you go. And he left. And as soon as he left, when Srila Bhaktisiddhanta turned to Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj and said, now you go and bring him back. And Sridhar Maharaj became confused. And he said, but Guru Maharaj, how can I bring him back? You've rejected him. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta told him in the same way that Kala Krishna Das was rejected by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but the devotees, they brought him back. So in the same way, same way you go and you bring him back. <laughs> so personal. 
We can't lose the devotees. We work so hard to get the devotees. We should love them. And even if they have problems, even if they, they, can't, even if they can't follow any of the principles, but if somehow still they're appreciative of Bhakti and Srila Prabhupada, then they're our friends. I, and I'll always appreciate them and love them. And I want to see the good things that they did before. The poet Devaki Nandandas describes this in a very beautiful way in his song Vaishnav Sarna. He says, Hoi Chena Hoi Bena Prabhu Jatta Das, Sobara Chalana Vandu Dante Koregas. That I offer my obeisances, Hoi Chena, all the devotees in the past, and Hoi, hoi Bena, all the devotees in the future. Fakir Mohan Prabhu once explained this verse to me, and he said, By the grammar, it has another meaning. That uh, Hoi Chena means all the people who used to be devotees, but they're not devotees anymore. Oh. Now they became Christian, they became a Mayavadi, yogi, or whatever, and they stopped practicing bhakti. But they were a devotee for two months in the ashram. So I love them, and I give respect to them. Hoye Chena. And Hoye Bena, I'm respecting all the people who are not devotees yet, but who will later become devotees, which means everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and th this is our tradition. That Merton, who, by the way, if you didn't know, Merton, I think you must know, but Thomas Merton was a Catholic uh, yeah. monk and a great thinker. He, he's coming from a religious practice, and this is what he's speaking, the difference between tradition and convention. Our tradition is bhakti. Our tradition is to, to love the Vaishnavas especially. And then we may have some convention. And convention means we have to act within the institution in a certain way, and we may do it in a mechanical way. And then the person principle gets lost. Yeah. And, and, and our movement no longer serves the function that Prabhupada wanted. That is true. Okay, so this is, you know, again, again, the purpose of loving devotees and connecting with devotees. So rules are important. But when we forget the purpose of the rules, then those rules, instead of bringing people together, they actually pull people apart. And I've seen sometimes, you know, spiritual standards, spiritual standards become like uh, weapons in ego battles. <laughs> so, and then it becomes a very unfortunate. So, you know, I am doing the right thing. You're not doing the right thing. So then I will beat you down with this right thing. We beat you down with this standard. What you mentioned earlier about, again, this could be a big subject about homosexuals. You know, when people ask me this question, what I generally say is that uh, there is the, the sexual energy can be a big distractor on the spiritual path. And there has to be some regulation of that sexual energy. Now, exactly how that regulation is to take place. Now, there is, there is a convention, there is a convention, or we could say there's a tradition of marriage. Now, but in certain other situations, like say when people with have different sexual orientations, then how that is to be regulated, that may vary from person to person. But the community to community. Yeah. But if we just impose one absolute standard and demonize people who don't fit in that standard, then we are we, we will not only lose a lot of dev potential devotees, but we will also be actually doing disservice to our tradition. Because the tradition is not just a tradition of rules, the tradition is a tradition of compassion. So the rules, rules shouldn't interfere with the flow of compassion. The rules are meant to help people access that compassion and rise to a higher level. So, you mentioned something about community. I liked your comment very much. Yes, William. Please. I, about community, I like very much your comment about joined nuclear families. Yeah. This is what's required. And there will be some Vaishnav communities, whether you like it or not, who are gay. And there'll be some Vaishnav communities who, maybe there'll be some Vaishnav communities we meet even, but they like to chant Hare Krishna. 
and do this and that. And maybe you and I wouldn't want to go there, <laughs> at least after Sodom. But, but they're Vaishnavas if they're chanting. And, and I'm going to give some respect and appreciation to them. But those are very gross examples. Yeah. But there will be so many different communities. And uh, if, if you study Prabhupada's, um, what is it? Um, I think it was in 1968. What was it? Uh, Statement of management is it is like, what is it called? Narna Rang was really into that. Um, anyway, I, it probably came out with a, a certain document for ISKCON, which apparently he kind of dropped the idea. It was an idea to, to do. But at one point, he, he made a statement that every temple should be autonomous. Should and be? Autonomous, should be independent. And the GBC, the function of the GBC is not to manage. But it's just to make sure everybody's chanting Hare Krishna, chanting 16 rounds, and doing the, the business of the society by going out on book distribution and Harinam. But each temple, the mood is there, and they of, of the headed by the local leader, and the devotees would vote that person in. I, I, I was always very inspired by that. And I, and I think that practically that's what's going on today. We have our temples, and they're important. They're important places. But they're largely meant for kindergarten students, for new people who are coming. And it's very important, the new temples. I'm not at all trying to minimize them. It's very important. A place for new people so they can get an introduction to Krishna consciousness and they can learn basic things. And that's part of our society, but that's not our whole society. Now, some people, when they grow up in that university of the Bhakta program, when they graduate, they may decide they're going to stay and become a teacher in that educational institution, or some of them may become a manager in that educational institution. And that's great, and they're, they're serving a purpose. But their function, their role is different than the new bhakta. And it's just so important that, that we become individuals, and we have individuals in our society, because our society is individuals. When we speak about community, it's such a necessary thing. Community means common unity. We need unity, not uniformity. <laughs> unity, not uniformity. So uniformity doesn't necessarily mean we have unity. But when we have common unity, that becomes community. So the unity of a you know, group of brahmacharis may not be the same as a group of grihastas or some Western people living in San Francisco, they're going to have a very different mood than some traditional persons born in a Vaishnava family in Gujarat or in Orissa or something. But we can respect each other and appreciate Krishnati, Yashigiri, Tam, Manasadi, Eta. Someone's chanting Hare Krishna, someone's initiated. I, I respect that. But I have my community. And then devotees can can become more empowered, they can be more happy when they fit in with that community. But if you try to, if you take, you know, some very strict uh, Gujarati raised brahmachari and you try to put him in San Francisco <laughs> or Boston or some such place, it's going to be very, very hard for them. They're going to have a crisis. They're not going to understand how to deal with things. So we need community. Like at Prabhupada, we may sometimes think that's Maya, but it's not Maya. If someone says it's Maya, you're being Maya. Maya means that we want everything to be one, and we everybody just to be part of the, the, the uh, impersonal whole. For Prabhupada's vision, he, he wrote a letter to Satsrup Maharaj saying, yes, it's a good, good idea. The black body devotees in Philadelphia, they can have their own separate center. And he wrote a letter to Jamuna saying, yes, it's a good idea. The ladies, they can have their own program together. It's a good idea, and it's necessary. I find it personally very difficult when I go to big temples, and they don't really have a strong uh, sense of individuality or identity for the temple. I go to a smaller temple, like the Govran Echo Village, has a very strong vision from what I've seen of it. You don't have such so many different members. But you go to a very big project like Mayapur, or like ISKCON New York, ISKCON Los Angeles, or ISKCON Bhubaneswar. There's so many different visions, 
and everybody's accommodating that for the purpose of the mission. And we appreciate that. It's important. But then it's difficult for individuals to develop further. And, and I think it's a very healthy thing to, to create community. And this is why I, I'll repeat again, wherever I go, I'm always trying to create community for myself and I'm trying to encourage devotees to create their own small community. Yes. And this is a point we were making in our last discussion too. It's important. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, so, this is a good point. I sometimes say if you are giving a class to say 100, 500, 1000 people, it's almost like everybody feels the class is for everyone else. <laughs> and they, nobody really connects properly. So when you define a community, are you defining that primarily by the ethos? That what is, how would we define that they have a shared understanding of uh, how they want to practice bhakti, a shared understanding of what, what, how would you define a community? Well, it begins with this shared sense of values. Okay. That's the first thing. Right? And the values that you may find that give these examples we were giving before, which are a little gross and they're bodies, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 someone living in San Francisco may have a certain sense of values. Someone else living in Gujarat will have another set of values. And they would do best to work together with people who have similar values. Or you want to bring people up to your values, or you want to change your values and go up to someone else's. But to the first thing in community, people talk about Van Ashram in our society, and it's a great idea. And Srila Prabhupada wanted it. But I consider it to be very controversial. It's not actually, I don't just consider it, it is controversial. There's so many different people quarreling about it and disagreeing. And why are they disagreeing? Because the first basic principle is not there. We don't have shared values. So if we want to create Van Ashram, the Prabhupada wanted us to do that. The first thing is we have to have Vada discussions. For discussions in the mode of goodness, we're not just trying to beat the other person up and, and defeat them and, and, and get them to accept your point of view, but you're actually listening to them considering their perspective and then oh yeah that makes sense and, and then through such discussions you may be able to come to having shared values and the values of, of devotees in sweden may be different from the values of the devotees in england may be different from the values of the devotees in orissa may be different from the values of the devotees in up different from the values of the devotees in mumbai different from the you know, every everywhere you go and bhakti Vinod speaks about this in chaitanya six amrita there's so many different communities with little different sense of values. Some, some communities are really into brahmachari life. The, the Denver Temple, at least for a long time, they had a very strong brahmachari community there. Other communities are really into grihastha life. And some communities, they, they can accept gays and lesbians, and then that's their, their mood. There's so many different sense of values. And it's not for us to say one is right, one is wrong. We respect all of them and they're chanting, but what's right and wrong is what is my sense of values? What, what do I relate to? What, what can I be appreciated in and grow as an individual? It's, I think it's very, very important for devotees to start creating community it, 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 for our society to, to, to expand and be, be faithful members of the society, work at the GBC, work at the local temple authorities, but create community with like-minded devotees. And just don't waste your time in some place where they have a different mood, a different set of values. That's, that's so practical, you know, that don't waste your time. It causes irritation to that community if we have a different set of values. And it causes irritation, discouragement to us. And uh, yeah, so I, I I had a discussion with Rajvihari Prabhu, the mediation, you know, who pioneered that. So he told me something interesting that he was a pioneer for passing a resolution that in the same city there can be different sanghas. There. <laughs> All glories to Rajvihari. <laughs> yeah. So he said, even if there is one temple, 
and to form a separate sangha you don't need the permission of that temple <laughs> <laughs> yes so, so that's that's good actually if you can find form our own sanghas and of course like earlier you said you have to earn respect we can't just do it uh, in the early stages because then we will we need some guidance and some shaping but over a period of time if we do that then so it's not just that uh, yeah, maybe this will can, i don't want to keep you for too long i'll talk about one point about cooperation you know that uh, when we if we prabhupad said your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate so sometimes the call for cooperation <laughs> is treated as simply uh, a, a a covered or a concealed call for submission to authority but that's not the only way of cooperation that, <laughs> <laughs> so that means at one level if the individual should be willing to needs to be willing to submit but the authority needs to be willing to give space and when both are there then actually there's genuine cooperation so cooperation so cooperation means both people's individuality is acknowledged and uh, okay the temple leader is an individual the temple leader has a particular vision and if some other devotee comes and says let's do things like this well no this this temple leader has their vision and if they are also doing something constructive then you cannot we cannot overrun their space so at the same time if this devotee has particular inspiration then they can do it in their space so cooperation has to run both ways so any thoughts on this prabhu thank you very much such such a really good point yeah um sometimes we find we as you were saying that, that somebody says cooperation means you do exactly what i tell you but also Ultimately, cooperation means to, to serve Krishna and Guru. That's real cooperation. That's pouring the water on the root of the tree, not just the leaf demanding attention. The cooperation means you should do whatever the leaf tells you to do. <laughs> A good example. Uh, and I, I've seen it. It reminds me of one senior devotee who's a friend of mine, who I won't mention his name, but he's over seventy years old. He's an artist. He's an intellectual. he's been a long-term book distributor, a long-term faithful member of Prabhupada society, Prabhupada's disciple. And he's having a crisis now. He's he's in his 70s and he he finds that he goes to the temples and they don't appreciate him. They appreciate the younger devotees. And I told him I said please Prabhu, you need to create community. because you just go somewhere and you have a little different mood you know you and i can talk and we can be friends or something but then if i go to a community where you're in charge and i'm going to stay there for a long time that's another thing <laughs> it's it's one thing to be casual friends but to start living with someone is more of a difficult thing so we want to cooperate but co- cooperation means what cooperation doesn't just mean that that you do what i tell you and that's that's cooperation but cooperation means we're cooperating with shiva prabhupada's desire cooperation means we're cooperating with chaitanya mahaprabhu and krishna and if something's in the way of that that's not cooperation that that's some external mayak thing that that we're putting a label on as cooperation these are these are these are things which again someone may say oh prabhuji that's not very practical we need to okay fine as you pointed out there's three different types of persons and there's a group of people who just need to live in the temple and work with the institution like that and let's respect them that's fine but we need to have that uh kind of broad mindedness that we see in the history of this come when shiva prabhu was present where he could allow the vote to come and he could be friends with Dr. Mishra you know Dalin Ginsberg and with my friend who hadn't taken a bath in one month <laughs> well could initiate him <laughs> and probably could love them and they really felt like they had a place in society but today we want things antiseptic and prophylactic we like everybody has the same kind of shoes and same kind of kurta 
and everybody follows the same rules and it's neat and orderly and that's okay. And a certain class of people will like that. But I've been to places like that and all the artists, they come and they cry to me and they say, my God, well, I don't want to have the same shoes as everybody else. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be like this or that. <laughs> That's true. So, in sometimes it's thought that surrender means conformity, but it's not necessarily so. There, there may be conformity for some things, but it's not necessary that conformity itself is surrender. <laughs> There are some amount of conformity is fine, but Prabhupada was quite accommodating about devotees to help them develop their individuality. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine somebody who is artistic and they may want to do things in a particular way, even something about their dress, something about maybe their hair or whatever. You know, that's not simply Maya. Now, to call it as Maya is actually, is as, as you earlier said, could be violence to their individuality also. So we don't want to necessarily encourage that, but we don't want to discourage that also. Give me your screen again. Share the screen with me. I'll, I'll show you something. A nice quote from Shiva Bhakti. I think uh, you... Well, I, I'm, I'm still there. Okay. Yeah. I got it. Okay, here we go. I'll go ahead and read this. I, I like reading. I like dramatic reading. You didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> um, he says, The Supreme Lord, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in pursuance of the teachings of the scriptures, mandates all absence of conventionalism for the teachers of the eternal religion. You know, you may have a good vocabulary, but for those who don't, this is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is doing. He, he's pursuing the teachings of the scriptures, and he's saying that to really follow the Shastra means there's no conventionalism for the teachers of the real eternal religion. It does not follow from this, however, that mechanical adoption of the unconventional life by any person will make him a fit teacher of religion. Okay, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission is an unconventional kind of religion, so I'm going to have a mechanical adoption of it. No, that's not going to work either. Regulation is necessary for controlling the, the inherent worldliness of conditioned souls, but no mechanical regulation has any value even for such a purpose. The bona fide teacher of religion is neither any product of nor the favor of any mechanical system. <laughs> That's, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, this is from Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's article called Putana, by the way. Yeah. You know, maybe you could, sorry. Uh, maybe you could share this uh, article and then I can put a link to that in the uh, video so that devotees can refer to it if they want, readers. So it's interesting, he says that regulation is essential but mechanical regulation is not. So uh, how would you, you use the word mechanical earlier also, mechanical would mean like a one size fit all or what exactly would we mean by mechanical? Mechanical in the same way that, that, that uh, uh, Thomas Merton is using the word convention, where it's just passive, or in the language of Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, to use more Vaishnav language, he says that there's three things, Abhyasa, Manana, and Smarana. Abhyasa, Krishna says in the Gita, Abhyasa, Yoga, Yuktena, but you should practice, Abhyasa. I think that's the same word in Hindi, isn't it? Yeah. Abhyasa, yeah. You should practice. And when we're practicing, it may be mindless. The new bhakta is sweeping the temple room and thinking about the nonsense movie he saw before he joined or thinking about his girlfriend or whatever. He's, but he's doing this activity. But after some time of that activity, his heart may become a little purified. And then he comes to the platform of manana. And manana means when he begins to evaluate and think, why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this? And that type of faith is a much higher type of faith, whereas the, the previous one is just low kick shraddha. It's just common faith because everybody's saying so, and I'm practicing this up in in a mechanical way. But we have to come, and I feel this is a very important principle 
for preachers and thinkers in our society, not just that, that we're like magicians, wizards, where we have bhakti and we put our hands on someone's head, and now you have Krishna praying. But the function of the preacher, I think, is to make people think. And to get them to start considering things from different perspectives. Because Vishwanath says, from a Vyasa may come manana, and then from manana will come smarana. And smarana means just spontaneous remembrance of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. You know, train people to think. I read a very interesting difference between education and indoctrination. Mm -hmm. Education and indoctrination, those are two good so, words, okay. So what is education teaches us how to think. Indoctrination teaches us what to think. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that means, you know, each of us is, we are ultimately want to think about Krishna, but each of us will think about Krishna in our own individual way. So we can't, uh, we can't mandate, this is the way you must remember Krishna. Each of us will be attracted to our one particular pastime, one particular, uh, whatever, manifestation of Krishna. So it's remarkable, one more point in that passage that you read, that Bhaktisan Vidakura also uses the word, I think, conventionalism over there. Is it so, uh, regarding the differentiation between convention and uh, tradition as Thomas Merton talks about it. So if preachers are meant to help yes. people, if, yeah. Yeah, we're meant to, to help people give up this conventional life, this absence of conventionalism. Another place, let me turn on, on the <laughs> thing again. Yeah. This is a, these are some of my favorite quotes. Our acharyas are just so brilliant. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is one of my favorite. He says, in fact, most students are mere repositories, this is a famous quote, you must remember this. In fact, most students are mere repositories of facts and statements made by other people, but this is not study. The student is to read the facts with a view to create and not with the object of fruitless retention. Students like satellites should reflect whatever light they receive from authors and not imprison the facts and thoughts <laughs> just as the magistrates imprison the convicts in jail. <laughs> wow. There's another one I was also thinking about. This is this that was from an article of the Bhagavad's philosophies, ethics, and theology. And in uh, Krishna Sanghita, Bhakti says this next one: ask like the devotees who are simply interested in the regulated principles and under the control of gross discrimination are unable to attain a higher platform. So when we speak about all these things, it's not just that we're saying it's because we're frustrated and we want some intellectual freedom. We want the best for Prabhupada's mission. We want it to, to fulfill its potential. We want Prabhupada's desire to be fulfilled. And it's not going to happen if people are just memorizing facts and, and rather they should reflect the light from authors, not just imprison the facts and ideas. It's, it's so striking that sometimes, uh, you know, memorizing verses is wonderful. You know, memorizing verses is wonderful. But sometimes some people think that just the capacity to memorize and recite verses itself is scholarship. But even scholarship is much more than that. And devotion also is much more than that. So what can be applied to facts can also be applied to verses. Now again, I'm in no way minimizing the importance of verses and reciting verses and being purified by that. But this is a powerful quote. And um, so the essential, if I understood right, the point you are making through this is that we need to keep always the purpose in mind and not get caught in conventions or rules, but move forward to ensure that the purpose is served. So for some devotees, the purpose may be served through conformity. And for some people, some devotees, the purpose may be served through individuality. And whatever is required for serving the purpose of moving closer to Krishna, that is what we need to pursue. And so cooperation, like I think we're discussing about cooperation. Cooperation means that ultimately we all should go closer to Krishna. 
So if say by submitting to an authority, a devotee is feeling so choked that the devotee is not blossoming in Krishna consciousness, then that that kind of cooperation is not actually cooperation. So the purpose of cooperation is, as you said, Prabhupad Seva Sangha. And each devotee should develop their relationship with Krishna and grow in that relationship. And, and for some devotees, and in some stages, it may be that submission is the way to move forward. Hmm? But for some devotees, it may be creating the individual space. Yes, bro. So, um, would you like to make any concluding comments? I we need to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Would you like uh, to concluding just, comments? You know, just take any time, Prabhu. I, I'll say this again. I, I get so much nourishment, so much hope from discussions like this when I find there's like-minded devotees. It gives me hope. Otherwise, you, you spoke about people becoming discouraged. When I only meet the people who just want to blindly retain facts and repeat them in a mechanical way, it becomes very discouraging. Yeah. But when I, when I see you and what a beautiful thinker you are and how you're encouraging people, it, makes me, it gives me so much happiness. Thank you very much for, for giving me some opportunity to discuss this with you. Thank you. I, I, you're, you're giving me so much hope. Oh, you have given me so much encouragement, so much food for thought. Thank you. Can I just summarize in a couple of minutes, if you don't mind? I try. We went to a lot of this territory. Basically, I think we discussed on what is ISKCON and who is a member. So you mentioned that if, if it is a society for Krishna consciousness, then whoever is Krishna conscious is a member. And then we might say that this is a very lofty definition, but Krishna consciousness itself can be very flexible. So anybody who is trying to even chant, and later on we say that even if somebody is not following the regulatory principles, says there could be a there could be a community of mediators, and but there could be a Vaishnava devotee community of that also Vaishnava community of that. So in an inclusive sense, everybody who is who is Krishna conscious is actually a devotee, and you quote you gave I think Fakir Mohan Prabhu's interpret reading of that verse. That even if somebody is not Krishna, Krishna conscious now, or somebody is going to become Krishna conscious in the future, they are also to be respected. And that means everybody is to be respected. And then uh, we discussed about what might cause disillusionment with the institution. And then mentioned it's primarily because of mechanical behavior. And uh, the way to avoid mechanical behavior is to actually see that the essence is developing relationships and while developing relationships, we saw that you know, every temple has its own mood. That means individual mood is manifesting in the temple and some devotees may be able to manifest their individuality through the institution. Those who cannot, if they need the space, like Prabhupada supported uh, Jadurani Mataji and others. So those devotees need to be intelligent enough to create that space. And we can, we shouldn't uh, minimize or criticize the managers. If, if, if we don't become manager, if we do, if we criticize the managers, then we will end up becoming managers ourselves. So <laughs> that was, and also uh, in conflicts, we can be empath, we can offer empathy without offering endorsement. So that way we don't have to take sides. And uh, then you quoted a lot from, I think, Prabhupada from Bhakti Sansa Thakur about how no mechanical arrangement can actually lead to the transmission of, of spirituality and Thomas Merton's differentiation between convention and tradition. So we need to take responsibility for our spiritual growth, not just follow some, follow some formulae. And uh, then we discussed about how even moral standards, if somebody slips and falls, so at one level, there is strictness, like Bhakti Sanjana Thakur was strict and told the devotee go, to go. But then uh, he told Sridhar Maharaj that get that devotee back. So we don't uh, reject regulation, but at the same time, friendship, that is a beautiful thought, that friendship does not know rules. And if rules obscure, rules block friendship, rules block relationship, then it could be a problem. And then I think toward the conclusion, we discussed about different kinds of devotees, you know, how they might work with institution and we can't expect freedom and facility both. 
So cooperation doesn't simply mean submission to uh, authority. Cooperation basically means that we all work centered on Krishna and every devotee flourishes in their individual growth. Did I miss out anything, anything major, Prabhu? No, I, I, I like these two points. I learned a lot from you. Join, join with your families. Yeah. <laughs> I thought... Freedom and facility. <laughs> and education means to teach you how, and, and indoctrination means to teach you what. <laughs> yeah. Many, very nice points I'm walking away. Thank you very much. I look forward to continuing our association in the future, Prabhu. Such exchanges, it will be wonderful to continue if you have the time. The COVID virus stops and, and we're back in Jagannath Puri. I, I hope you'll come and we'll feed you <laughs> if you come to our ashram and we can have a beautiful talk then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Humble obeisance, Jai. Thank you. I look forward to coming to Puri whenever it works out. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.